We humans are so proud of our big brains, our computing capacity. We think we are special and we are right. That's our superpower. That's our trick. But if you and I are that clever, how come we haven't figured out how these large neuron computers on the top of our necks evolved in the first place? Imagine two football teams fighting it out for victory. One is made of five people, and the other one is made of six people. The larger team is more likely to win. In the evolutionary game of life, then the five is wiped out, and the six team will make little babies of, on their own side and little babies onto the other side. So now two teams of six will be fighting it out against each other. But suddenly, the new advantage is to have an additional person on one side. So then seven against six plays it out, and the seven wins. And the same thing happens. So I wonder whether we were continuously pushed towards ever larger groups, because not it was an advantage in the environment, but it was in the advantage against other groups in warfare. And that would explain why there was a continuous pressure towards larger groups and larger brains to process those larger groups. And at one point, those were so big that you needed something else as well. You needed gossip, you needed language, and you needed a facility that will be able to process really complex Machiavellian machinations of the others. So, in this 7 a.m. segment of the crazy 24-hour State of the Species lecture, we were discussing this, whether warfare is the secret, the dirty secret of our evolution. There is something that kept constantly bothering me, and that is actually how I got into evolutionary anthropology to start with. I got into evolutionary anthropology when I talked to Robin Dunbar once in a pub, as it happens in, in Oxford. And we were sitting in a pub, we were chatting, and I was working on some economic network. I wanted to use his social brain hypothesis. So Robin's social brain hypothesis says that you have large brain because you need to compute a complicated society, a large number of people. So when you increase the group size, you need to increase the amount of social thinking, and hence you are going to have a larger computer on the top of your neck. This was something that I wanted to have the mathematical version of. So in the pub, after a lecture, I said to Robin, we, we didn't know each other before, and we were just chatting as it happens, and it was in the Rosen Crown for those who know Oxford. And I said to him, can you please pass me the mathematical version of the social brain hypothesis, because I'd like to use it. And Robin said, no, oh, well, it doesn't exist. You do it. So I get down and started to work on it. And what he didn't tell me, that there were more than 10 attempts to turn the social brain hypothesis into a, a mathematical mechanism, and it, it never worked. So just let me work on it. But, and, Incidentally, three years later, we published the paper on this. So we sort of sorted it out and we, that sort of re, re changed the question on a bit. So this was the observation. So the x axis, this is Robin's graph, the x axis is the size of the neocortex relative to the rest of the brain. So the size of the front bit of your brain relative to the rest, which is a, a good proxy for how, how clever you are. And the y axis is the, is the social group size. So, how many people are, how many individuals there are in your group. And this early observation suggested that there's a relationship between the two. So, this was sort of the question. And then I'll show you in a little bit of later how we solved it. But something bothered me about this because. We always tell the story. And so the predecessors to Robin, who sort of hypothesized about this, and then Robin always tells that 
if you want to live in a larger group, you will need a larger brain to compute the social information about more people. So it makes sense and let's get down to how do we do it. But why would you need to live in a larger group? So it really bothers me. Look at the top here. So when you have a, the group size, let's stylize, yeah? so there's a number of individuals engaged in, in doing something together. So this is a production function. And then the y-axis is how likely that you're gonna succeed. Let's say you are going to hunt an elephant. And when you move up here, the, more, the larger number of people you're going to have is the more likely you're going to succeed. So if you have 30 people, you're gonna definitely bring the, the elephant down. And if you have 10, well, that's just not enough. But if you're lucky, you might be able to get it. Five people, no choice. So that's sort of the idea here. So if you divide this curve by the number of individuals, so it's the same, the bottom curve is the same as the top one divided by the number of individuals involved, you have this, this pattern, yeah? So that would suggest that there is an optimal group, group size, yeah? So here, I don't know, 19. So that is when you have the maximum amount of resources per head. So that's how many you should be. And this is going to be true for every group living species. So it's going to be really your production function. In other words, your ecological niche that is going to determine how large your group is. Orangutans like to live in groups. When orangutans have enough fruit around, they will gather together and live like a group living ape. They actually prefer to be with each other. But the food is so scattered that it makes no sense for them to cling together for much of the year. So they are sadly lonely for much of the year when there's not enough food. So orangutans have a curve which sort of goes up right here. So the ideal number of individuals is going to be somewhere here. And it's, we know that a chimpanzee group will split up into two if they grow big enough, unless they, are, they have a reason to stay together, like warring together. So chimpanzees will also have a characteristic group size. The same thing for bonobos. There's not enough food that we split up. The same thing for human groups, yeah? Human hunter-gatherers live in fish and fusion societies and they're split up because it makes sense because they are here somewhere on the curve. So that's, that suggests that the group size is fixed by the environment. So what on earth was driving the larger group size? If this story is true, that we have larger brains with larger group size, then suddenly we have, we have a problem because there's not gonna be any pressure towards larger, larger group size. So there will not be any pressure towards larger brain size. So hence came the idea that we can change the production function. So one, one way of changing the production function is that it, it becomes somehow shallow so that you have a continuous increase in the, in, the, in, in the benefit from the group size. And a version of that is when you have war. So this is the same curve as before. Yeah? So this is the number of individuals in the group. This is the probability of success. And this is the average payoff, the, the average payoff yeah? from the group given the function. Yeah? So you end up with an optimal group size here set by your ecosystem. If you have, however, a competing group, human group, with whom you are competing for shared resources and you're warring, so the stronger will win, the fact that you have this will actually change this curve and will shift it to the right. So from the continuous curve, you move to the dotted line. 
So that means that your optimal group size moves from a smaller group to a bigger group. And it's just a weird way of saying that if you're warring with others, you're going to have an advantage from having a larger number of soldiers. And then when you have one, because you had a larger number of soldiers, then you replace those you wiped out with yourself. And when you replace them, suddenly you have a competition with, with the new group who used to be one and now split because they were so successful. So that would suggest then you are going to then have a new pressure to being bigger again. So this story about intergroup war would result in a continuous pressure, exactly the kind of continuous pressure towards larger brain that would suggest that that brain could have evolved because brain doesn't come about, not, nothing in evolution comes about like this, yeah? It, you can't have suddenly a large brain. You have to have a gradual shift towards the larger, say you need something that is gradually increasing, that's gradually pushing you, that gradually, cre gradually creating a pressure. So this is the story we have, yeah? So, so we might have had a climatic shift 2.6 million years ago that created fire and the ability to to fuel larger brains. Then these guys spread around the world. And then maybe this is the moment, moment when war happens. And war happens and that creates a continuous pressure towards larger group. And brain, the larger brain is just going to be one of these. Another one is going to be language. Another one is going, first music and language. Another one is going to be inequality regulation, another one's going to be telling, mapping the uh, story, mapping the world, telling stories together. So in a particular period of our history, war might have played a very important role in creating the pressure that ended up in, in, in us. Okay, okay so, so if war was the pressure, then how did the brain increase happen, yeah? So that was my question. And I will show you how, what we came up with and what the consequences might have been. And in the process, I learned something that the, so we sort of redefined the question. So rather than a social brain hypothesis, I think it's much closer to a social complexity hypothesis. So we are larger brain, but we are also having a host of different tools some of them are inherited that allows us to live a larger and more complex society. So this is, this is the problem that we have in here. Yeah? So we, we sort of start off from this point here. So this is a small group of primates with relatively few connections to each other. And in a way, the social brain happens. The original question was how you go down on this route. Yeah. How you are going from this side to this side, like increasing the, larger, the number of agents. But actually what's happening is we were also getting more complicated. So we are connectedness increased. So a lot of the tricks, this was one set of tricks, but this was another set of tricks. And you put a different kind of pressure on the brain when you go up and you have to process along this route, or you have to go and process and any one of these preset number of agents, this route, more complicated society. This is what we need to somehow explain. So in other words, the conundrum is this, yeah? We have a bunch of primates, apes, that have chimpanzee bonobo sociality. But we see them in a very large group, in a kind of group size that you only see herding ungulates. Yeah, so for, for some angular species, you can have an actual herd, not a super herd, an actual herd of 200,000 individuals. But you can't have that with the chimp bonobo sociality. You need to have a fleeting sociality for the herd, for the herd to exist. So how the hell is it possible that we live in these 
super complex societies that have even more complex social behavior than the chimps and still uh, and very, very large. So for that, let me step back a little bit and let's understand a little bit of something about collective action. So let's say you can have a simple collective action like these geese uh, here that uh, just flew uh, above uh, Whiteham even a few weeks ago. Uh, so this would be a very simple way. Yeah? So they are not trying to do something together. They are just fitting in a particular bit of the air where it's easiest to fly and ends up in a particular pattern. Yeah. As opposed to not so simple. Yeah. Like I'm bringing you real sophistication here. Uh, and the not so simple one is a tree house. Yeah, so a tree house is going to be, this is, the tree houses are built in, in New Guinea. Uh, they're high up in the canopy and you need 30 people at least to build it. And um, there's a lot of anthropologists who think, oh, well, the tree houses are really, you know, how, how amazing is this culture? I mean, once you're there, it's obvious, they are fortresses. The whole point is that you can shoot arrow down and so the, it's a very wet place. So the, the rain is about eight times uh, the amount of rain in Oxford. So it rains a lot. So it's very difficult to burn a tree house down from the bottom. If somebody tries, you can simply shoot them and that's it. So these are really fortresses the way I think about it. But anyway, people live up here, live their lives up here and go down to hunt and collect stuff like that. Uh, it's a safe place. It's, it's like a keep. Um, so to build this, you need a lot of people to take a lot of risks and you need a lot of coordination. So somehow you need to convince them. So we have a really simple co uh, collective action, a really complicated collective action. So when you have a simple one, one of the examples for a simple collective action is predator avoidance. So if you look at the top picture here, can you see the, where the lion is? Yeah, so this is a lion. And the lion is attacking a bunch of wildebeest who are trying to flee. Yeah, the bottom one you have a bunch of fish, schooling fish that's being attacked by a shark. So these, if you're interested in these guys' actions or these guys' actions, it's a very simple problem, yeah? So you need to have some kind of coordination in travel. So in which there's some kind of inf information diffusion about which way we are going. If any of you has seen uh, my cow video on the Human Beast channel, you can see there is that you know I'm I'm cycling cycling with a bunch of cows, and and the way I realized that we are a herd is that I was cycling in you know, my usual commute to to Oxford on the Thames Path, and suddenly a whole herd of cows started to go by me by me, and I look back and these two uh, shepherds, the cowmen. They were, they were on their motorbikes and like, vroom, vroom, vroom. And this vroom, vroom, vroom was the equivalent of a predator. And these, these uh, uh, herd animals, they were fleeing from the vroom, vroom predators and they were running really fast. And they, this is how they were being moved between different pastures. And I, uh, I think I can say that I pooped myself. I mean, it was really scary because you're on the bike and you're just cycling, 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 and suddenly vroom, a lot of very large animals. So I was cycling really, really fast among them. And, and on the video, I come across maybe a little braver than I was. The reason I didn't stop wasn't that because I was so brave. The reason I wasn't so, there, there were cows on my left as well and on my right. So just, I was cycling for my life. And then suddenly I noticed something. The cow on my right kept looking at me and it kept changing its speed with my speed. And I know from mathematical models of this kind of synchronization, this kind of herd or flocking behavior or schooling behavior, that what you're doing is that you are, you are actually adjusting to the nearest animal to you. So it struck me that that cow next to me was treating me as another animal fleeing from the predators and mm -hmm, shepherds. And we were synchronizing together. So at that point, I was part of a herd running from a lion or a schooling fish swimming away from the shark. And 
I'm hoping that it's not going to be me who's going to get eaten. And of course, for these predator avoidance, which is a very simple collective action, that's the point. So if I go on an outer alone and the lions will eat one human, I'm going to be finished. If I bring Dan with me, then uh, one of us will be eaten. So I'm say at 50% probability. So thank you, Dan, for being here. <laughs> you might be eaten. So anyway, so that's the point of predator avoidance. Yeah, The more we are around, we are going to be less likely to be eaten. Of course, then a bunch of other coordination pro problems comes up. When do we go to the pasture as opposed to when do we go to the water to drink? But it's a fairly simple problem compared to the much, much more complex problem. When you have increasing returns to scale in the environment, I'm using the economics language to explain how you get to the point that specialization pays off, yeah? So when you have increasing returns to skill, you have a payoff from spe being specialized, but then that means that the group will want to, you to do something that you do not want to do because it's too costly. So you might do a little bit of taking risk towards, I don't know, mapping the forest, but you are so good at it. And the more you do it, the better you are. The group really wants you to, oh, can you please go and really map it? But then you're taking a lot of extra risks. So others can now suddenly free ride you. They can say, oh, Dan, why didn't you check the leopards in the forest? I will stay here with the food. So that free riding appears when you have this kind of complex technologies. Yeah? And to this came the idea from Bill Hamilton, and I'm going to come back to him much later, that you need to cooperate with your relatives. So like a beehive or a bunch of wasps or termites or ants are doing exactly this. They are cooperating with their relatives and a lot of them. And hence you can have 70,000 individuals in a beehive and act almost as one. There was another, another solution to this when you have non-kin interactions. Again, I will come back to this later is that you have some kind of reciprocity. You build a reputation with one other, and that is the primate solution. So while the first one was discovered by, by biology, the second was discovered by biology and mostly economics, that you can interact based on reciprocity. And this is what primates do. This is what we do when we groom each other. We have a give and take, yeah? But there's a problem with this because to build a relationship based on reciprocity, it takes time. You are not going to spend all your time with a lot of different people. You want to spend it with one other person, a few other persons. They become your friends. So these dyads, these two-way relationships, became these stable, long-term relationships. So that means that you are going to have limited sociality. You're going to have limit. You're going to be limited of how much, how much time you can spend on friends and hence how many friends you're going to have. So you're gonna have a limited number of friends. And if you have a limited number of friends in a large group, you have suddenly a structured network because you can't be friends with everybody and hence the network can, will have its own structure. And in a way that was my first realization when I entered this world of, 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 of evolution anthropology, that this is where structured networks come from. So jumping back from the very beginning, the origin question, we want to understand how the global society works. Here was a one piece of insight that will be true for the global society, that the global social network is going to be a structured network. Mathematically, very briefly, mathematically, the problem is that you need to do group coordination where the payoff comes from a collective action. And you need to be able to efficiently coordinate this group to have payoff from the collective action. You need to do the coordination of the graph, which has N elements, it's called N sized, and K regular. Everybody has K friends. Everybody has the same number of friends. And 
k is smaller than n minus one. So not everybody is connected to everybody else. I'm just saying the same thing that I just said now. So in this case, the question is, how do you increase the group size when k is fixed? So the number of friends you have is fixed. Can you increase the group size in a way that you still coordinate the group? See, there are two limitations here. One is that you need to coordinate the group for the collective action. And the other is that the number of connections that the individuals in your group will have will be limited. So can you increase the group size and do both of these? And it turns out this is a really tricky thing. So this is um, the behavioral synchrony model we sort of invented. So let's, let's look at this graph. You want to synchronize this graph. Everybody's linked to six people. Yeah? So number nine is six, one, two, three, four, five, six friends. Yeah? And everybody has six friends. You're number eight, one, two, three, four, five, six. Everybody has six friends. And all of them, there are 20, 20 people, 20 individuals in it together. Now let's say that we are going to give a compass direction to everyone here randomly. So number nine gets a compass direction, let's say zero randomly at first. And then if you meet up with somebody, you can switch to a shared compass direction. So let's say that number nine is friends with number 16 and number 16's compass direction is 140 degrees. Then they will end up with 70 degree, both of them as their compass direction. And then all of these individuals are meeting with each other. And then every time they meet, they go halfway. Basically, this is what you do is that you, you can measure the average distance from the directions that the agents have as, as they meet each other. So as time is passed, these agents will actually synchronize. There are some beautiful uh, mathematical results that show that, that if you have uh, at least three connections per agents, you're always going to find a direction. They're always going to synchronize. If you have only two connection, you can see how it might not work because there might be in a circle. And in a circle, they will never actually find the compass direction. But in, if you have uh, more than three, which is gonna be true for every human group, we will be able to have some coordination among ourselves. So the problem is, what if you have a time budget for, to do all this coordination? So every ape group, chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, orangs, and ourselves, we are limited in the amount of time we can spend socially. So that means that there's going to be a point, let's call it a tau, the number of connections you can possibly have. It's a, it's a limit in time, yeah? So you can't wait until this goes to almost zero. You have to stop somewhere before. So if it's costly to have a social connection, if it takes time to time and effort to build friendships, then all of this will mean that you will evolve a number of connections given the task of coordination. Yeah? So this is the cost of having a friend. So here you can see that you're trying to go as close to others as possible. So you're in each individual is trying to go as, trying to be as coordinated with the others as possible. Beta is the cost of having a friend and K is the number of friends you have. And this is the evolutionary steps. And this shows how many, how many friends an average person in this group has. And you can see that as the cost of friend changes, if the cost of friends is, is, is low, uh, people will have a lot of friends and the cost of friends is high, people who have few friends. It's not that surprising. But the point is that these two measurements, so the, the time limit and the cost of friends, the beta and the tau, together will give you a curve of how, how the different group size, so this is the x-axis down here is the group size, how the group size affects the level of coordination, how far you are from each other when you finish coordinating, yeah? And then let's say that 
this there's some kind of limit to how coordinated you must be to be able to say that the group is coordinated. So let's say that we agree that we need to go one direction uh, to uh, hunt. And then if we are within five degrees of agreement, everybody, then we go together and successful. If it's more than five degrees, the final distance from each other, then it fails. So that's, that's sort of the limit here, the lambda limit. So the point of all of this, what I just shown is that these three, so you have a time budget, it costs it to have a friend, and you have some kind of efficiency for how good you must be as a group to have uh, the coordination. It gives you a maximum group size. So when this curve of how, what is the average distance from each other as a function of the group size, it hits, gives you a group size here. This is your group size. This is the maximum group size. That's it. In other words, you are limited. Even if it would make sense for you to war with others, it's you're limited of how group, large a group you can coordinate. Even if you have a reason to have a larger group, you must have some special trick that allows you to go beyond this group size. So the question is, what on earth is that special trick? Because we clearly have that and others don't. So we must have sold something here. So this was, I'm not gonna bore you with more mathematics, but I will show you the results of this simulation. So what I did is that I had a bunch of these agents and these agents were trying to coordinate with each other on, on a compass. So the compass is here sort of a, a symbol for uh, a stand-in for a more complicated coordination problem. And what I did is that I limited how smart the agents were. I limited simply by, I allowed the agents to give information to each other but I limited whether uh, they were able to process that, limited, uh, that information that they were giving to each other by simply how long they were able to calculate it on the computer chip. So if you were a stupider agent, you had a little time on the computer chip, on the processor. If you have if you're a smarter agent, you had more time on the computer chip. So here on this axis, was the calculation capacity, so basically the stand-in for the brain size. Obviously our brains are computers made of neurons. Okay, so, uh, and given each of this smartness, you had a maximum group size, a maximum group size that you are able to coordinate given these limitations of cognition. So what happened is that I allowed yourself to recognize that you are different from others. So that is the basic thing when you're coordinating something with others and you are comparing your coordination directions, your compass directions, the first thing you need to know is that you are different from, from all the others, otherwise you can't coordinate. So very, very basic knowledge about, soci about the society. So that means that if I allow you a larger, larger capacity to think, actually the group size can increase, like the social brain hypothesis suggests. The problem is that suddenly you hit a limit. And when you hit this limit, you can't go beyond. You can get smarter, but you can't go beyond. But then I thought, what if you can tell the others apart? What if not only you can tell yourself who you are, from the others, but you can tell whether the others are one lot or separate different people with different names and has different pieces of information and different level of usefulness. So if you do this and you have a, if you have a small uh, group like here, it's very expensive. So you need a large brain to calculate an even small group, even a small group, but suddenly very rapidly you break through this barrier and you can achieve a much larger group. I mean, obviously, if you can tell how useful other people are rather than wash them into one lot, you will be able to coordinate a larger group. Problem was that this also hit an upper limit. So even if you can tell everybody apart from all the others, you will not be able to go beyond. And I thought, 
what if I allow them one more small thing? What if I allow them to tell each other about the last piece of information they heard from somebody else? So third party information, like a gossip, but the simplest form of gossip, yeah? Just the last information. And suddenly, if you can process third party information, you break through both of these. And the nice thing about third party information, it doesn't really have, although in this calculation, the particular framing has an upper limit because you can always complicate it more. It doesn't really have an upper limit. So you have, you end up with these sort of stepwise evolution. So if there is a pressure, maybe from war, towards a larger group size, the larger group size pressure could end up in not only a larger brain capacity, but also a more complex social behavior. And of course, this implies language. And I'm, I'm way, way beyond uh, what I wanted to be. Uh, but now let's have a break. And then we come back here when we will process the next batch. And those who just came on, I saw you quite a lot of you. Hi, Tanya. Uh, hi, Anna. Oh, okay, so many. Uh, hi, uh, uh, Hey, Dekai. I'm running really late. So there are two bits of information because I think now there's a, a less of an overlap with the, with the starting lot. One piece of information is that I didn't sleep last night. I was so excited about this lecture. So if I mumble, uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, the other piece of information is that we are running way behind the schedule. So anyway, so who's, who's the chat break? Who's running the chat, chat now? Uh, wait, what time is it? Uh, Dan, Anna, Tanya, and Krista. But oh, now I promised you to, to do music and language, and that's coming. I did a little bit of language, Krista, at least. But uh, <laughs> the music bit is just about to come now. So I'm sorry. Anyway, we can chat. If you were here, what did you think? Sorry, so is there a break now? You meant break for chatting? Yeah, not break for you uh, combing your hair or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so break chat, for talking. Yes. So that we have 50 minutes of chat. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah because break is sometimes. sometimes. Okay. So now there's a break. Uh, for chatting, it's so chat time. No, it's actually, I think, I think you should definitely uh, have another sip of coffee or, or do whatever you, you need to, to continue. And, uh, sure, take a 10 minute power nap if you need. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I'm not there yet. I'm, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, you, have, you have to time your power naps well, of course. Yeah. Well, you I'm can, extremely you can, impressed how much, by the way, not just by the contents, but also by the way you handle it. Uh, given that the sort of the stage you described at 5 a.m. was also visible and you seem to have woken up, you seem to have recovered from that uh, from that state. So. Oh, right. Yes. Well, uh, there's going to be more, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and you, you can enjoy the sunset in Tokyo. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Mm. Nice. And all the new all the new buildings are blocking Mount Fuji, though. So. Mm. Otherwise, it would be nice. It's still nice. Yeah, the weather's been great here. So where is everybody all over the world? This here is Leiden in the Netherlands. Yeah. I've just uh, I've just had the kid hand over here. My my parents yeah. came to pick them up. So uh, yeah. Oh, that's Hello. So they, La Provence. They, they... Uh, awesome. Yeah. Hello, I'm, about five, I'm about five minutes away from Tamash. <laughs> I'm in Budapest, Hungary. Awesome. I'm in Burgundy, in Avalon. Some of you. Oh, how are you doing? Uh, <laughs> wow. Hello, Burgundy. Hi, Benoit. I'm in Liverpool, and I just woke up. I mean. Anna, do you have snow there? First yeah, snow. I have snow. I don't know if you can see it. But oh, it's... yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. it's sticked. Oh, in Esto I'm, hi, I'm from Estonia, Tallinn. Uh, we yes. had snow this morning also, but it's too warm. It didn't stick. 
But my kid uh, refused to watch cartoons. He decided to watch skiing. So instead of cartoons, he's excited about winter. Are there any skiable mountains in Estonia? It looks like I thought it was a pretty flat country. Oh, there's no mountains. Yeah, right? So you have to, how far do Zero. you have to go ski? So how Finland far do you have to go or ski? Sweden. Finland. Yeah, that's a, that's Finland. a trek. Finland. <laughs> Yeah. Who wants to go to Sweden anymore, guys? Oh, that's yeah. true. Yes. <laughs> I, I I think I think Sweden is being scapegoated. I don't think the situation there is any worse than anywhere else. When you look it at the is, numbers, believe me, it is. It is yeah? Sweden now. Yeah. And they have mm. no plans. They, I I just know this from inside sources. They really. Oh, you know, they are they are they are scared. Bon promenade, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Estonia and Finland is doing better. Happy birthday, yeah? Day after me, yeah, actually. Oh, right. Happy birthday to you. Uh, we have the same age and two days age. difference. Oh, no, really? Uh, really, really. Oh, wow. My children see you so often as well. Ah, okay. Uh, the pizza, you gave, you gave me the pizza uh, secret. In Venice. Yeah. All ah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Many people around, on this, around this around here had eaten some of my pizza. So some of your pizza, really. <laughs> no, no, you are doing. Choirs, choirs over the Zoom. I've always wondered how, how do they tackle with the latency if we all sing the happy birthday to you, huh? Happy birthday, you birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Yes, because we're all such a pathetic attempt to get right to get in of the next 18 hours. <laughs> <laughs> more around the world. No, 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 it's all coming. It's all coming. <laughs> all, all at different times. <laughs> Every hour, it will get better and better. Right. Okay. So I will now show you uh, our brain capacity. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> so, I wish I had some. So what we're gonna do is that so uh, so we are going to fill up this lady's head. She is my grandmother. Her skull, so somewhere down there, um, had uh, about a thousand three hundred thousand. Uh, 400 uh, cubic centimeters of brain. So this is going to be the skull that we're going to fill up. So first, we're going to look at a chimpanzee's brain. So this is brain juice. <laughs> By the way, if in case uh, you're, you're not aware, the way we know about brains is some people take the brains out and zap them. So actual brain juice, but this is not obviously. And, uh, so that's not wine? <laughs> this is not wine, but you're right, it should be. So a chimp, so this is a chimp, uh, a chimp's brain. Chimp, bonobo is a little less. So this is maybe the bonobo. And let's, let's mark it actually. I think what you need to do to get the markers to start, you have to hold it upside down and push the point down. So you hold it and it should spring inside. Yeah, there's a spring, yes. Right, so you hold it down until the ink goes all the way to the tip. Okay, so just wait. You just wait, yeah. Okay, all right. So you need a design professor here. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Yeah. What is? Yeah. See. Okay. So this is a bonobo. So this is where the bonobo's brain is. Yeah. Now let's add a tiny bit more. And this is. This is where the chimp is. Why does a chimp have more, a larger amount of brain? It has a larger body. 
the chimpanzees, if you have a larger body, you need basically more stuff to run it, yeah, more computing power to run it. Now, the thing is that Australopithecines had probably the same or almost the same level as chimps. So when we are at the point of before the Homo erectus jump, before that story at 2.6 million years to 1.9 million years ago, our brains, our ancestors' brains was this much. Yeah. And then with Homo erectus, that changes. So with, with Homo erectus, suddenly this level, let's, um, let's get a little bit more here. Uh, actually. was suddenly moved up majorly to, well, there's a, there's a big variation. <clears throat> I will show you the variation. Um, so we need to add another 300 to this. So now, this is this, this was the Australopithecus. And then with that big change, somewhere between 2.6 and 1.9 million years ago, this much, we added this much to this much. And this is a really important step because some studies who actually look at how much you can um, eat during the day without cooking, or without having very high density food like bone marrow, you will not be able to uh, eat enough to fuel this much brain. So when we added this additional bits, there had to be some solution. So the story I was telling was that that solution was cooking. The story some other people tell is that solution was eating bone marrow and brains. Quite possibly both were true to some extent, but definitely bone marrow, I buy the bone marrow story, but I think maybe, maybe you needed to have cooking as well. Anyway, so then with that, we add this much more. So suddenly you had, yeah, you had the bonobos, you had the chimps, you had the Australopithecus, and now you have Homo erectus. So these guys, with this much brain, were able to spread around the planet. Left Africa, to Europe, to the Caucasus, to uh, Southern Asia, Indonesia, and to north of the Himalayas. Then, gradually, and maybe that was the period, period when warfare was important, gradually, there was a pressure so that by around, where were we? Yeah. By, that's a lot of brain. So by around 800, this much more, 800,000 years ago, this much more was added. It's a really weird because there was a period there where there are not a lot of uh, uh, skulls. So it's very, very typical. So this was, let's do two bits actually, the bottom of the range. Yeah, so this was the, so, so this was the bottom of the range at the time. AD for head of agencies and add another 200 to the top of the range. Here we go. So 
So this was Hedy's top range. Yeah. So you can see that this was where Chim's bonobos and Australopithecines were, the Erectus range, and this is here. So we are dealing with a much, much smarter, much more brain powered individual. So the, if the social brain hypothesis or the social complexity hypothesis happened, it happened somewhere here and it fueled this change here. And then uh, the next um, 800,000 years, uh, there were some more changes. So there was this much added to get to what we call, let's call, uh, to the maximum of the anatomically modern human A um, age, but which also has a range that goes down all the way, uh, all the way here. Yeah, so it's a range. And then we also had Neanderthal brains that had even more. So the Neanderthals were the the why the way I see it as the European the European uh, humans yeah so uh, it has a larger brain which somehow was wiped out by the so Neanderthals it's funny yeah that because Neanderthals that have basically a range a similar range but they had larger brain as well. There are all kinds of explanations out there why the Neanderthal brain might have been, might have been bigger. Uh, and the, there are some people try to explain away this additional bit saying that some other brain function took it all, took over. But I think at least I am convinced that the most likely scenario that these species here was already basically one species. So there's a lot of brain, no? Look, all this is in your head. So again, now you can, you can see it, yes? Yeah? So we start off with a bonobo here, chimps australopithecines, yeah, down here. Then the giant st step towards erectus, you need something else than just eat, eat uh, leaves, occasional meat and fruit. And then we have from the erectus, up here to this range here, yeah, where we are already 800,000 years ago, overlapping with today's range. And you have an even larger skulled version, uh, which has a larger overlap range than the endotons. So this is, this, is, this is what might help us to place all of these into a particular time plan. Because of course, the next question is, when did all of this happen? So if language appeared, if larger brain appeared, when did all of that happen? So this is the, the, the capacity of, uh, of our brain. And this is million years backwards, so million years ago. So this was four and a half million years ago. Uh, this were the Australopithecines, signs, yeah? Chimps are down here, bonobos are down here, yeah? These were the Australopithecines. signs. Then there was this, curious period of nothing at all. Uh, I don't think uh, many of you were here at the very beginning when I was discussing how it might have been a shift in, in, in the climatic uh, cyclicality, the climatic pattern that might have explained the jump from here to up here to Homo erectus. You know? And then about this point here, so somewhere 800,000 to uh, uh, 600,000 years ago, we have suddenly an overlapping range with the current range. So the, the current range is somewhere here and then Neanderthals were ranging and even, uh, even have an even higher range for, for brain size. So when did all of this happen? And so my bet is that the big pressure was somewhere here. The 
Human Be series is about understanding who we are as a species so that we can equip ourselves to take responsibility for the planet. Because if we humans are not going to do that, there's nobody else who's going to save the biosphere. If you'd like to be part of this conversation, please subscribe here now. Thank you.